Have you ever been in a large group of people, like, like maybe a concert, a wedding, or a political gathering, and somebody up front with a microphone appreciative of your collective presence says, I love you. This declaration of love towards a group isn't particularly specific, and sometimes it isn't even all that meaningful. It's certainly different than a father's peculiar love for his child or a husband's unique love towards her or towards his wife. And I can be tempted to think of the Bible's statement of God's love for Christians, Jesus' love for the church, as if it's a general statement of love for a group, but not particular nor personally intimate. For humans with limited capacities, expressions of love towards a group are quite different than specific expressions towards individuals. But God has no such limitations. I want to consider God's specific, peculiar love towards each of his children. If you're his, for you, his love for me this morning as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together. So open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. And if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. There's some men on these aisles who will put one in your hand. If you don't own a Bible, this is yours to keep, to read. So this chapter, chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians, it begins by describing the condition in which we're all born, in which we all lived, in which some of you hearing my voice this morning still live. Paul writes, and you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all formerly conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Not a single one of us naturally has the ability or desire to please God. There is nothing naturally, inherently lovely or meritorious in any of us. We were all, by nature, children of wrath, day by day, earning more and more and more of God the judge's righteous wrath as we sinned against him. But now verse 4 starts with two of my favorite words in all of the Bible. But God. And listen to what it says. It says Ephesians 2, 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show us the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? But God, because of his great love, with which he loved us. This is not a general love, but a specific life-giving, self-sacrificing love for us, for each and every Christian. Christian, it's a love that chose you specifically before the foundations of the world, not because you were love-deserving, but actually the opposite, even when you were dead in your transgressions. It's a specific love of a father, Ephesians 2, 5. Christian, it's, a God's, it's God's love that adopted you according to the kind intention 
of his will. And God's love in Jesus led him, Ephesians 5.25, to give himself up for the, his church so that he might present us, his bride, to himself as holy, a spotless bride to a loving husband. Every Christian can and should declare, like Paul in Galatians 2.20 of Jesus' love, he loved me and gave himself for me. And now look back down at Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. Because of his great love with which he loved us, both collectively and individually, Christian, he took us from the death of sin that we found ourselves in, and he made us alive together in Christ, raised us up with him, and seated us in the heavenly places. What's the, the reason that he did that here? So that he could show his love to us forever. So that in the coming ages, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us. This is, this is beyond unfathomable. If you were to make up good news, you could not make up good news this great that the God who created and sustains the universe the one who measures the light years of galaxies with a span has love for individuals, for people. A love that would move him to give himself up for us, to reconcile us to him, to make us his children, to form us together into a church a spotless bride for his son. Oh, Christian, this is an amazing, peculiar, particular, active, personal love. And this puts everything in our lives in perspective, doesn't it? If God is for us, if he loves us, who can be against us? God did not spare his own son, but gave him up to adopt us, to adopt you and me as sons and daughters. So at this time of communion, we are told when we take the bread and juice that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The men will serve us, will come serve us the bread and juice in a minute, symbols of Jesus' body and blood that he gave in love. Reminders of God's wrath poured out on his beloved sinless son because of his great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses and sins. So if you're a Christian, take these symbols when they come. If you're not a Christian, if you have not turned to Jesus in faith, despairing of any ability you might have on your own to please God, then you must know that you're still a child of wrath, not a child of God. But if you're hearing this, if you can hear my words and you can consider, if you can consider the offer of grace, please don't leave. Please don't leave today without turning to the Lord in faith. Find me after the service. There's going to be people over here on your left who would love to pray with you share the good news. There's people all around you who would love to tell you of this love of God and how you could know him as father and not judge. Don't leave without talking to me, but when the bread and juice come, please let it pass for now. Now, finally, turn in your Bibles to John 13, 1. We're going to be here just one minute. I want this passage in particular on your mind as we take the bread and juice. Here in John 13, Jesus leads his disciples in the first Lord's Supper in anticipation of the cross that lay just hours away. And John comments, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Immediately in the context were obviously the disciples who were with him. 
but certainly the objects of his love, whom he loved to the end, all the way to the cross. It would include all of those for whom he died, all of those who he from whom he or whom he would call from death to life, those who were predestined from before the foundation of the world to be adopted as sons, all those who can declare with Paul, he loved me and gave himself for me. God has a particular love for all of those that he calls out from the world, a love that drove him to the cross, a love with which he loved us all the way to the end. D.A. Carson comments, the objects of the love of God in Christ in these chapters in the cross is therefore not the lost world, but the newly forming people of God, the disciples of the Messiah, the nascent church, the community of the elect. Jesus had loved them all along. He now showed them the full extent of his love. In a second, you're going to have some reminders of the full extent of God's love. His body broken, his blood poured out for you. Jesus, as he sat with his disciples at the first Lord's Supper and persevered all the way to the cross, loved his own until the end. Christian, you're there in that verse in Jesus' love in John 13, 1. If you've been saved by grace through faith, you were in Jesus' mind at that first supper as he loved his own completely, personally, all the way to the cross. Let's look back in remembrance and look forward in proclamation as we take the bread and juice together. Men, please serve us.